When I was looking for a new LG V40 after being robbed, I came across a phone that caught my eye. It was the LG Q6 which was being sold for just $10, but as it's often the case with things that sell for so cheap, it had a major twist. The screen had cracks on the top bezel and the seller didn't tell me, and I didn't notice until I removed the screen protector. Anyway, I had to take the L like a man and move on. Luckily, the damage doesn't affect the screen itself or the selfie camera. This phone came out over 5 years ago in July of 2017. The idea behind this phone was to take the beautiful design of the LG G6 but cut in some corners to sell it at a lower price. Back in 2017 there was this trend of trying to make bezels smaller to get the most green real estate possible, but that was for the most part reserved for the flagships. This LG Q6 was one of the few exceptions. And not only that, LG introduced for the first time on a cheap Android phone the 18 by 9 aspect ratio which I still think is the ideal aspect ratio for a phone, since it's not like super tall and narrow as modern phones. The screen is only 5.5 inches, making it compact and easy to use with one hand. The frame is made of aluminum, which also houses a slot for the endangered micro SD card, so that's a plus. The back is made of plastic, which is not something I care about since I use a case most of the time, though something that could annoy some people is the omission of USB Type-C. Surprisingly, the screen quality still holds up relatively well. Sure, it's not on the same level as an iPhone 14, but it's not bad. The resolution here is 1080p, and for a 5.5 inch screen, it's more than enough. Viewing angles, color reproduction, and contrast are quite decent, but brightness levels are somewhat low at 505 nits. The speaker is located at the back, and that's a bummer since we have to redirect the sound using our hand. And sound quality is mediocre. But now, let's see what's inside this little phone. The LG Q6 had a Snapdragon 435, which was a bit overpriced for what it had to offer back in 2017. It came in two variants, the first had 32GB of storage and 3GB of RAM, and the more premium one, 64 and 4GB. In my case, I have the first. However, these specs, though bad, are still more than capable for dealing with regular everyday apps. And that takes us to the software. Running Android 8.1 with the last update date into September of 2019, it's clear we're not getting more updates. And forget about custom ROMs because we can't root the phone. LG's UI is quite light and for the most part it feels like stock Android. There are unique perks to the skin like the FM radio which makes use of the headphone jack, a music player and the gallery app which I happen to like a lot. Despite being a couple of versions behind, this version of Android is perfectly usable. Most apps and pretty much all social media apps are still compatible. Instagram runs very well, but you might encounter some lag when scrolling through reels. But there's something that really bothered me. When doing light tasks, sometimes it starts overheating, and it usually happens when I was watching YouTube videos with something in the background like the browser. It doesn't happen all the time, but it's really weird. Speaking of web browsing, most pages load just fine, but if you open many tabs or have something running in the background, it can get quite laggy, but overall it's a decent experience. The camera on the LG Q6 is a mixed bag. We have a 13 megapixel sensor with a focal length of 2.2, which is still enough to get the job done for the most part, but it has several caveats. The lens that covers the sensor is made of plastic, so it's easy to scratch. The time it takes the phone to take an image is quite high, even in broad daylight. This results in blurry photos if the subject is moving a little too fast. As you can see in these photos where the movement is clearly noticeable, something that shouldn't have happened since there was plenty of light. On the other hand, if we take photos of static objects or landscapes, the camera is not bad. We have acceptable colors and levels of detail, but in many shots it's clear more HDR is needed. Thankfully that can be fixed using the Google camera, which does a good job. However, on some occasions, it ends up adding necessary noise or making some photos look over-processed. But that's the price to pay for an overall better camera experience. And you can always switch to the main camera if you don't like it. For macro photography, it's not bad actually, but it's not anything breathtaking either. In low light conditions, it's a different story, and the plastic lens really wrecks havoc with strong lights. And if you take photos of moving objects, they're gonna come out blurry. So at night, I wouldn't use it much. Sometimes you could get a decent photo, but most of the time they're gonna look bad. And finally, for video, we can record up to 1080p at 30 frames per second, which is nothing special. The Galaxy S for me could do that back in 2013. The video quality itself is quite meh, 
but taking into account that it only cost me $10, I guess it's not that bad. If we go to gaming, the GPU inside behaves very well with old games like GTA San Andreas, where I'm playing with everything maxed out and it's more than playable on these settings. It's not perfect though since there are a few frame drops here and there. Anyway, heavy games of that time such as Nova 3 or Gangster of Vegas will not have any issues with them. Moving on to heavier games, we have Into the 2, which is playable in minimum settings. There's some lag on certain occasions, like when I'm controlling the submachine gun. There's also lag in the menus, and sometimes it crashes out of nowhere. But it's never happened inside a game, but it can get quite annoying. League of Legends is the most demanding game we can play here, despite having a 64 bit processor, I couldn't get Life is Strange or Dead by Daylight to run here, let alone Genshin Impact which are quite demanding games and only work with this type of processors. So we can safely say no, it's not a phone made for gaming. Having said this, I do not recommend playing League of Legends here either, it takes too long to load a match, so much so that the players are already there in the game by the time it's done, which is so frustrating to see. Emulation wise we can emulate all consoles up to the PlayStation 1 era, so I'm going straight for the PSP. Almost all games are playable and the processor is powerful enough to emulate at 2x many games. However, there are many games that will not have the most ideal performance, like it's the case of Kingdom Hearts, where we experience significant frame drops when there are many NPCs on screen in certain scenarios, though in general it is playable. The same thing happens with Manhunt 2, it lags in some parts when there are many NPCs, which confirms that LG's kernel hinders performance in games, since the Galaxy S4 Mini with the Snapdragon 400 ran this game better even when the Q6 moves everyday apps with much more ease. And finally, for Otami, I was actually surprised the 6 year old phone still had this good battery life. I would usually get 5 to 7 hours of screen on time, which is actually quite good. Once I left it on standby for a week, and it still had 7% left, so that speaks volumes for LG. In conclusion, the LG Q6 is still a relatively solid smartphone in 2023. It may not have the latest and greatest specs, but it's still a great choice for those on an extremely tight budget who want a compact phone that looks and performs decently. But if you have a bit more money to spend, the LG Q6 is not worth it anymore. And to answer the question, yes, the LG Q6 was worth the $10 it cost me. That's the end of the video guys, and I'll see you guys the next time. Bye.